Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to One Civil Law, where, as always, we try to learn from the misfortunes of others. I am your host, Uncivil Law, a licensed attorney in Texas, Virginia, and before the United States Supreme Court, and I hope you're having a great day. So we are here with the continuing coverage of the Take Care of Maya trial. Maya Kowalski. You know Maya Kowalski. She is a girl who went to John Hopkins Children's Hospital for some treatments relating to a debilitating condition relating to pain and then was hijacked and kidnapped and a whole lot of other things happened to her. And I think it presents an interesting and complex case, to be sure. I don't really think it's easy. I don't think the answers are necessarily obvious. I don't know who exactly is right and who's wrong in this scenario. It is, it is to my mind, something that is very complex and raises a lot of very interesting questions. But we are not here for the deeper questions right now. All right? We're not here to try to solve all questions. We're here for a specific purpose today, namely a motion to disqualify a juror, which is like, dude, this has got to be good, right? This is, this had better be good, right? You want to disqualify a juror who's already sitting on your case. This had either be, this had either be, be either, uh, this has got to be either one, this juror lied to us during voir dire, in a pretty critical way, right? And we have evidence of that, that they lied during voir dire. Or they've been doing something inappropriate as a juror. And somehow we know about that somehow, which like how? But it's got to be one of those things, right? Either they lied to us during voir dire, or I suppose they're not an eligible juror, I, I guess. Somehow they managed to get through the, the system but they're not really an eligible juror. They're, they're statutorily ineligible. So either they're statutorily ineligible, they lied to us, or they've been doing some sort of malfeasance. Anything other than that, right? It's like, what are we even doing here? So this had better be good. So we're going we're gonna to cover this and see what they have to say. So what does John Hopkins have to say for all their glory? Okay, let's talk. Yeah, let's see what's going on here. So... This is a motion to disqualify a juror from John John Hopkins is filing this motion, which you know doesn't exactly scream with confidence right away. It's like, you know, that John Hopkins wants to remove a juror. It could it be because the jury is not going their way? Could it could that be the problem? Let's see what's going on here. All right. Defendants John Hopkins All Children's Hospital by and through counsel moves for the court order disqualifying juror number one from serving on the jury, which deliberates to decide the above styled cause. Okay. Defendants submit that juror number one on multiple occasions and through multiple questions and statements communicated to the court in connection with the questions has revealed a bias and prejudice in favor of the plaintiffs and against defendants and a violation of this court's instructions to the jury not to form or express any opinion about the case until retiring to the jury room. This is not going well already. This is not going well already. Um, yeah, it's not bias when they don't like you because of things they've heard in the courtroom. This is the difference between bias and judgment, as we've tried to express. You know, bias is when you come into the case favoring one side or the other. But if you come into the case neutral and five seconds later you decide you hate the party because you don't like them for because of what they're saying, you know, you're going to start forming an opinion pretty fast. How long does it take you to start judging somebody? Not very long, right? How long does it take you before, while they're starting to talk before you start to form an opinion about them? Not long, right? So if 30 seconds into your opening monologue, they're like, you know what? I don't really trust this guy. That's not bias. That's based on things they heard in the courtroom during the court proceedings. It's not extrajudicial. It's from the proceeding. And it's because of you. You're the one who's causing the problem because they don't like you. So, no. Uh, and they similarly, they can have, they're not allowed to have opinions about the case as such, but they can have opinions about things they've heard, right? Like, I don't trust this witness. I don't trust this expert. I don't trust this attorney. That's not the same thing as having an opinion about the case. 
right? They're allowed to form opinions as they listen to witnesses. They just can't have an ultimate conclusion about the case until they hear all the all the evidence. But they're like, you know what? I don't like the plaintiff's witnesses. I think they're full of shit. That's that's distinctly different. So we want to say that this this juror, because of their questions, doesn't like us very much. I'm not really feeling the motion here, guys. I'm not feeling the I'm not feeling the motion here, I, I have to say. So apparently this juror doesn't like us very much. Okay, good. Yeah, that's fine. So uh, they apparently have some bias and prejudice in favor of the plaintiffs and against defendants in violation of the court's instructions. Uh-huh. Uh, yeah, sure they do. All right. So what what did they do? What did they do to lead you to these wonderful conclusions? All right. Throughout the start of this trial, throughout the trial of this cause, the jury duly sworn hear this case, along with the alternate selected, appears to have paid diligent attention, and their attention has been reflected in a substantial number of juror questions. That's good. In the process of posing such questions, however, one juror, identified as juror number one as questions, has repeatedly revealed not only substantial bias and prejudice in favor of plaintiff and against defendant, uh -huh, but also in violation of this course instructions that he or she should not form or express any opinion about the case until you've retired to the jury room to consider your verdict, having heard all the evidence, the closing arguments of the attorneys in charge of the court. Uh huh. Once again, I'd like to take notice the difference between prejudice and judgment. Right? Prejudice is prejudgment. That's literally what prejudice is. You judge it in advance. That's prejudice. Prejudgment, okay? Because before they open their mouth, before they do anything, you've already formed a conclusion. That's prejudice. When they start opening your, their mouth and you form an opinion, that's not prejudice. That's justice. That's judgment. That's not bias. That's judgment. They don't, they don't like us very much. Their questions are hostile to us. Okay, this is this is going great. Juror number one statements involve the following, apparently. All right. Most recently in questioning nurse Sylvia Balwig, a witness called by defendant, the juror prefaced a question by making the statement to the effect the witness was a breath of fresh air. Hey, guess what? This this juror likes this witness. They think this, this witness is a good witness. They find, they find them credible. And by implication, find some of the other witnesses less than credible. I don't care. No one cares. Since they were the first person from the defendant who appeared to have cared about Maya. Okay. This juror, this juror likes this witness. They think they're a good witness and find them credible. Great. Moving on. In a question to the defense witness, Kelly Thatcher, APRN, juror number one asserted that his ethnic background was the same as the decedent, Bita Kowalski, with the result that both the juror and decedent tended to be pushy. It's reading a lot into that. Juror number one stated specifically that they identified with decedent and questioned whether the witness had overreacted to decedent Suggesting a brief that she had done so due to suggesting a belief that she'd done so due to ethnicity. How in the world are you getting all that from what you've presented? I, I, what did the juror say? The only thing you put in quote marks was literally one word, the word pushy. That's all you put in quote marks. So I'm going to assume that's all you have. Because otherwise you would have quoted more, right? If the juror used words like, hey, can't help noticing we're from the same ethnicity. You know, I like my own ethnicity. They're more credible. If they'd said things like that, presumably you would quote the juror saying that. But they didn't say that. Y'all, you said literally the only thing in quote marks in this paragraph is the word pushy. So is that all the juror said? And if not, why are you not quoting the juror? 
are you trying to extract like how much are you trying to extract from this word pushy you know i okay this is this is great this is this is going great <laughs> Number C, juror number one asked the question of an earlier witness stating, see, there's a lot more in quote marks here. There's a lot more in quote marks here. So again, they know how to quote things when it helps them. Juror number one asked a question of an earlier witness stating, there appears to be probable cause of improper action by slash of Sally Smith in her assigned role at JHACH, thus indicating the juror heard firm and expressed an opinion regarding the case. Well, no, they have a tentative thought, but that's not necessarily, you know. I was expressing an opinion regarding the case and the evidence in violation of the court's instructions and indicating a predilection against defendant. Yeah, you know, they, so far they don't really find your side very believable. It sounds like you got some ground to makeup counselor sounds like you have some ground to make up to me okay point d juror number one expressed an opinion and prefaced to question the witness indicating an understanding crps can come and go get worth or reside slash disappear thus reflecting not only opinion about certain matters and issue but accepting the plans evidence before having her defendants well that's what they understand so far because that's the evidence they've heard so far. Um, that is what they've heard the witnesses say. So that is what they have an understanding of. No. No. Just, just absolutely not. No. Questioning witnesses, questioning various witnesses called by the defense, including Charlotte Laporte, in an adversarial manner, what the hell does that mean? Confronting her with questions regarding whether she can beyond doubt affirm that or whether she was able to attest to matters she addressed in her testimony. Specifically, those related to Catherine Betty and telephone calls, again, indicating an adversarial predilection against the testimony and in favor of plaintiffs. Um, they don't like your witnesses and they like plaintiff's witnesses a lot more. Um, they find plaintiff's witnesses pretty credible. They don't really find your witnesses particularly credible. What do you want me to do about this? You know, what do you want me to do about this? Oh, Lord. Question F. Questioning witnesses, including Mrs. Tori Nikas, as to whether her team or the hospital possessed certain photographic or video evidence. By posing this question long before testimony had been concluded or argument submitted, the juror indicated that a burden had been placed upon the defendant above and beyond any contemplated by the court. What? The, they want to know if he possessed certain evidence. That's a question. So they're, they're soliciting information so like i do you have anything along these lines that you could give me that i could consider i'd really like it if you did you know this is this is hilarious i'm having fun this is stupid they don't like your witnesses very much they don't like your hospital very much i think you're gonna lose <laughs> Point G, in questioning Ms. Laporte, the jury in question began a question with representation that plans had provided a dress for Maya Kowalski to defend or Miss Betty, indicating prejudgment of the evidence with respect to that issue. That was their understanding of the evidence up to that point. They've heard some testimony. They've gained some information from the witnesses. They have a question based on the information they've heard. Uh, yeah. Wah, wah, wah. We don't like it. Wah, wah, wah. The jury, the jury doesn't like us. They're not. They don't like our side. They don't like our thoughts. Wah. 
Point H. In the same question set, the juror in question confronted Miss Laporte with questions regarding whether she knew the dress in question resided in Miss Beatty's office and or whether the witness knew it was not timely given to Miss Kwask, indicating acceptance of plaintiff's evidence before having heard all the same. Well, I'll point out that accepting of their evidence is not the same thing as, as reaching an opinion on the case. But they have some thoughts as to which way the case is going. They have some thoughts, and those thoughts are generally, you know, I like what the plaintiff side is telling me. I find the plaintiff side pretty credible. I imagine you wouldn't be whining so hard if they said, you know what, I don't like the plaintiff side. I think they're full of shit. You know, this whole thing is dumb. The hospital didn't do nothing wrong. Bet you wouldn't object to that one. But you have a problem with it because they're not ruling, they're not finding your way. You know? Yeah. Point I. Questioning at least one witness with the preface that Plaintiff Maya Kowalski was more mature than a usual 10-year-old, which is probably true because she had to deal with a lot, which would necessarily probably force her into some sort of version of maturity, plus having to deal with fairly complicated medical matters would have to inform her development somewhat, I would imagine. She's going to be a little bit different than your typical 10-year-old, I would guess. Some factors that may have influenced that, you know, point generally in the direction of everything and or handled her pain differently, thus expressing opinions that reflected acceptance of plaintiff's evidence and testimony and expressing opinions regarding the same. Uh, once again, having an opinion on the evidence or testimony is not necessarily having an opinion on the case, or at least not finalizing that opinion about the case. You know, I'm sure, I'm sure they'll be more than happy to hear your witnesses and what they have to say. And they will just be so good and just destroy the plaintiff's case. You have nothing to worry about, counselor. You know, they've just, plaintiff, all plaintiff has done is put up some smoke and mirrors, you know, a little razzle-dazzle. I'm sure that you'll reveal the trick in the second half, and uh, they, they will sanction plaintiff for wasting everyone's time. Mm. Mm. All right, questioning witness Stephanie Graham in an adversarial manner. I don't even know what that means. Regarding statistics relating to success of her case ratio, and also regarding her interrogation of plaintiff Jack Kowalski, despite the witness's own testimony, the discussion in question was an interview, not interrogation. You know what that means, among other things? They don't believe you. See, the witness said, this is an interview, not an interrogation. You know what the juror said, who is one of the members of the finder of fact? I don't believe that. That's some bullshit. The witness didn't, the juror didn't believe the witness. Ooh, ah, the juror didn't believe the witness. They thought the witness was lying. Okie dokie. Thus indicating an adversarial attitude and bias. Now, once again, they actually heard the witness say those things. And they thought this witness is full of shit. Um, they're the finder of fact. Do you understand how jurors work? Do you understand what they do? See, uh, maybe, maybe that's the problem. Maybe the... Maybe John Hopkins Children's Hospital and their legal team doesn't understand what jurors do. So let me help you out, all right, for, for them, because they're confused, right? They're confused, so maybe you're also confused, okay? Jurors are the finders of fact, okay? What jurors do, all right, is they hear a bunch of witnesses say things, and they see a bunch of exhibits, which witnesses say depict things. But then the jurors get to decide for themselves 
whether they agree or disagree with the witnesses. They can look at the evidence, the picture, the video, the medical document, the bill, the receipt. They can listen to the words of the witness and they can say to themselves, you know what? I don't agree with that. I don't think that's what that picture, video, document, receipt, record, reflects. I don't agree with that expert witness. I don't think this wit I don't think that expert is an expert in this area. Or I don't think that really is their opinion. Or I don't think that opinion is any good. Or I think they're full of shit. Or I think the witness is lying. I think they are making stuff up. I do not believe them. That is what jurors do. That is what they do. They they listen to things and then they decide what are and are not facts. Witnesses don't decide what facts are. Jurors decide what facts are. I'm glad I could clear that up for everybody because apparently I needed to do that. <laughs> Somehow I need to clear that up for everybody. All right. So the witness said it was an interview, not interrogation. Well, okay. So that's interesting. I don't get wrong. Indicating adversarial attitude and bias. Well, maybe they just think your witness is a liar. Question K. Questioning witness Richard Ellie in a sarcastic and biased manner, and I'll take a note here, there's no, there's no quote marks. And also reading sarcasm on the written word is difficult at best. But I'll just take note here that there's no quote marks to indicate what the sarcastic and biased manner was. So thanks for the lack of quote marks. That's very helpful. Point L. Questioning witness Billy Seisel after a preface regarding him as a newbie indicating bias against credibility of witness. I don't know that that necessarily indicates bias. Just because someone is a newbie doesn't necessarily indicate bias. It indicates they're new. And sometimes someone who's new can be very uh, good at their job. And also because they're not particularly stuck in their ways, they can sometimes have novel approaches to things. But someone who's new on the job might be very good. And you know, just because you've been there 30 years doesn't mean you're bad. And just because you're new doesn't mean that you're good or vice versa. So, you know. Question M, and I'll take note here that there are quote marks. So once again, we know how to use quote marks when we like them. Questioning witness Billy Sizel after pressing the same with, is it possible Maya's waning abilities could be contributed to JHACA's causing the limitation of family interactions, the stress and trauma Maya's testified to, documents, document statements by Maya about her mother's status told by a hospital, Miss Betty. The court statement not only flies in the face of this court's instruction to the jury regarding the role of DCF, but also accepts as true Plaintiff Evans long before having heard all the Evans. The juror, the juror is not leaning in your favor, sir. It is, it is not going well for you, sir. I'm sorry, and all that things are not going your way. But the jury is sitting, they're hearing evidence, and they're having some thoughts. Do better. Get good. Get good. <laughs> you know, if I'm in the hospital, now sounds like a really good time for some settlement discussions. You think it's too late to settle? <laughs> Question N. Questioning witness Sally Smith by referencing Plam's testimony regarding the length of time it purportedly took hospital staff to respond to telephone calls, thus indicating acceptance of such testimony. Wow. Did you, did you hear that guy? Did you hear that, guys? They heard the witness, and the witness testified to things, and they believed the witness. It says it right here, right? They they indicate they accepted they accepted testimony. There was a witness, and the witness was testifying to stuff, and the juror believed them.
Question point oh. Point oh. During the same sequence of questions to the witness Sally Smith, implying the hospital itself was guilty of child abuse. I, I, I would take note that there is some information from which a reasonable person could potentially form that opinion, yes. Of course, you could form a different opinion. I think it's more complex on the medical side. Uh, but you could form that opinion. There is, there is sufficient information from which to draw that opinion. I'm a little bit more tentative personally, but, you know, that's, that's me. But, you know, this juror, less tentative, which is their prerogative. Wow. The juror doesn't, the juror doesn't agree with me. What do you want me to do about it? They're the juror. Emma? The questions indicate obvious bias in favor of plaintiffs and against defendants. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah, no, no, none of those things. Absolutely none of those things. Not even a little bit. Thank you, Alan Parker, for the gift memberships, as always. They are appreciated. Um, my response to this is mostly laughing in counsel's direction, to be honest. A party seeking to remove a juror for improper behavior in the course of trial must show the juror's actions amount to misconduct. That would be right. Yeah, misconduct. A trial judge must excuse a juror when there's reasonable doubt whether a juror is impartial. Reasonable doubt as to a juror's impartiality should be resolved in favor of excluding the juror. Bias need will not be demonstrated with unmistakable clarity. While trial court is afforded great discretion in ruling on challenges to jurors for cause, close cases involving challenges to impartiality of potential jurors should be resolved in favor of excusing the juror than leaving rather than leaving down. Wow. That's 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 cute. As set forth here in the standard for juror misconduct is satisfied in light of juror number one's apparent prejudice. Again, you keep using that word, prejudice. I don't think that word means what you think it means. Prejudice is pre-judge. That's what prejudice is, pre-judge. The juror seems to be judging things based on what they're hearing in court. That's not prejudice. That's just justice. They believe this witness. They don't believe this witness. Also, they don't seem to believe your case as a whole. Things are not going your way. And even if there were any doubt regarding jury number one's bias in favor of the plaintiff, and there's not. This is so stupid. That doubt must be resolved in favor of disqualification. As a practical matter, moreover, obvious bias on the part of a juror risks a hung juror, a hung jury. Yeah, right. You wish. You wish. If other jurors believe the jury in question, juror in question has violated his oath, what the hell are you talking about? Finally, no party will be prejudiced. By removing juror number one, well, I don't know. I think the plants might be slightly prejudiced because juror number one sounds like they're going in plants' favor, so I think they'd be a little bit prejudiced. Thus, giving ample number of alternatives have been chosen, the alternates in question appear to be every bit attempted as the primary jurors. Such a procedure has been approved to move multiple floor to courts. Uh huh. In Alberger, for example, a personal injury jury was permitted to ask questions as the jury has here. At the close of the evidence, Appelli objected to one of the jurors on the grounds that, from the nature and manner of the jurors' questions and comments, it was apparent the juror had shown bias and lack of objectivity in the case. Well, without any sort of factual comparison, which is not present here, by the way, I can't really intelligently speak to how close Alberger is, which kind of pisses me off, incidentally, because it's like you're making me do work. Also, 
The reason it's not here is probably because it doesn't help you. Because again, if it did help you, you'd probably mention it. But it's not here, right? So what were the questions? What were the comments in Alberger? Right? But they're not here. So you're making me look it up now to try to figure out how close they are or not. And the reason they're not here is almost certainly because they're not close. So you're trying to mislead me and I don't like it very much. The trial court substituted an alternate for a jury in question over a pound's objection or Pelly's pound's objection and did so without questioning the juror. Okay. The third district held there was no error in the trial court doing so or in the manner in which it did so, deferring to the trial court's discretion. Sure. Okay. I mean, it's an abuse of discretion standard either way. So, yeah, could the, juror, could the judge remove the juror? I guess. I wouldn't. I'd mostly laugh in your face. So, you know, appeal that. Let me know how it works for you. In doing so, the third district noted that any purported error was harmless and that another juror was available. Sure. So in, in that case, for whatever reason, the, and I, we don't know the reasons because they're not here, the judge in that case removed a juror and let an alternate sit, and the Court of Appeals was like, yeah, we're good with that. But what is not even evident from these facts, not that there are any facts, incidentally, what's not even evident here is that in Alberger, if the trial court had not done that, would the Court of Appeals reversed? Because all, that's, all that you're telling me in what you just recited to me, the Court of Appeals said there was no abuse of discretion by removing the juror. Which doesn't necessarily imply that there would have been an abuse of discretion by keeping the juror. See, the thing is, the judge gets a lot of discretion both ways. And quite frequently, both decisions can be legally tolerated. Doing one thing and also doing literally the exact opposite are sometimes possible. In fact, are kind of frequently possible in the grand scheme of things, to be quite honest, because judges get so much discretion. So did the judge err by removing the juror? Apparently not. Would they have erred by keeping the juror on? Who knows? Also, we don't know what the, what the basis of the removal was. So this is totally not helpful from a precedential posture at all. Although Florida case law is not uniform on whether questioning a juror before disqualification is necessary, Alberger supports the proposition that the act of questioning a juror under circumstances at issue could reinforce their prejudice. Well, I would, I would say that it's not necessary if it's manifestly obvious, right? We don't need to ask questions if it's manifestly obvious. So asking the juror questions might be a valid procedure, but if somehow as the court I'm able to determine this juror is biased or not objective or whatever, from their questions and I make the decision without asking the juror, is that necessarily an error? I'd say no. And the, this, court, this court apparently said no too. So is it necessary? No. You can do it, you cannot do it. Again, abuse of discretion. Judges get a lot of latitude. Welcome to law. You know, welcome to law on all that. It's so stupid. In addition, given the extent of juror number one's apparent bias, prejudice, and failure to follow instructions, any questioning by this court would serve no useful curse, given that the juror is well beyond rehabilitation. <laughs> well, therefore, we move to disqualify their juror, this juror. Yeah, okay. My response personally is mostly laughing in their face, is my official legal opinion on this one. My, my official legal opinion on this one is mostly laughing in John Hopkins' face. That's my thought. You know, this, there's not enough here. There's not enough here. You know, you had preemptory strikes. You could have done better voir dire. 
or maybe your case just sucks. Maybe there's no amount of war deer you could do. Maybe your case just sucks. You know, the lawyers got to the lawyers got to do the best with the cards they have. And some car and sometimes lawyers can do some wonderful things. But in the end of the day, you know, put a dress on it, but the pig is still a pig. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, that's all I have to say about that. All right, so is there any... The plaintiffs filed a response. Did they file a response? If there's a copy of the plaintiff's response, I'll be happy to cover it. So does one of my mods have a response for this? If so, I'll be happy to cover it. But I, I haven't seen the response. But I'll give them a chance to catch up in case they have it. But my response would be mostly in the form of laughing in their face. Yeah, I don't have I don't have the response right now. So as the judge, I'd probably be a little bit pissed. Also, because one of your witnesses, let's say, um, misled the court on the stand. And I'm also not liking you on a personal level, which again at this point is not prejudice because it's based on things you did in court. Right? If I don't like you because of things you did in court, that's not bias. That's not prejudice. That's you pissed off the court, and now, now you have a problem. How can you send it to me? My email, Kurt at UncivilLawLLC.com. Kurt at UncivilLawLLC.com. And you can send it to me. Now we'll look out for it. And we will cover it. So, yeah, if you just piss me off as the judge, and then I'm like, I'm ruling against you because you pissed me off, Oh, well. Will the other jurors know about this? No, not right away. They won't. I'm not even sure juror number one will ever know about it, to be honest. I wouldn't be telling juror number one. I'd mostly be laughing in counsel's face. We don't like them. They don't like our witnesses. They don't believe our witnesses. They believe my enemy. All right, I'm signed into my account. I'm just waiting for this magical email to show up. I am visiting my parents right now, so I'm traveling. I'm having a great time. Response for the plaintiff is rather spicy. I look forward to reading it. K-U-R-T at uncivillawllc.com. Yeah. Send email. I'm just waiting for it to pop up in my email box. I'm looking. Hasn't shown up yet. Hope my mom and dad are well. Thank you very much. They're very well. Thank you. I noticed LLNC is extremely pro-defendant, but other channels are pro-plaintiff. I couldn't, I couldn't speak intelligently as to that. I haven't been watching their channels extensively, and I couldn't speak to how the zeitgeist of that channel is viewing things. Um, Oops. $10 from Duncan, Idaho. I'm just wondering what you think the likelihood is of elements of this motion reading the threshold of the judge's desire to... What does it say? To... Lock it up against appeals 
and so excuse the juror. This case is getting appealed no matter what happens if they decide in favor of Maya. The cause of action is questionable from legal principles, especially for the death of Maya's mom. And, and Lawn Lumber's been covering that. And honestly, and I, I don't say it with any disrespect to you guys, but I don't see how they can win on appeal because it's, it's a completely foreign cause of action. The email address is K-U-R-T at uncivillawllc.com. Still waiting. Um, so, yeah, if they decide in favor of Maya, especially if they give awards in favor for the self-deletion of Maya's mom, I don't know how that survives appeal. Yeah, I don't know how that survives appeal as a matter of law. Alan's spam and trash. There it is. Okay, cool. Excellent. Very good. Thank you, Marion. It was in my junk mail folder. So we can fix that. All right, let's lead read uh, the response. This, this should be good. Let's read the response. Thank you for sending it along, by the way. That's very, very kind of you and appreciated. All right, plaintiff's response to defendant's motion to disqualify. Probably we're not fans. I'm just going to guess here. Come on. Plaintiffs oppose defendant's motion to disqualify based on some of the jurors' questions that defendants assert revealed a bias in favor of plaintiff and show the juror violated the court's instruction not to prejudge the case. Defendant is factually and legally wrong. Yeah. Probing questions do not show bias, and defendant ignores the ju juror asking probing questions of both sides. Defendant's tactic, if successful, would promote gamemanship for parties who want to eliminate a juror during trial and undermine confidence in the judicial system. Plaintiffs note that parties have been provided copies of the juror's questions through last Thursday. Nevertheless, nonetheless, defendant chose not to quote the actual questions, opting instead to describe the questions or quote small phrases out of question. Context. Yeah. I noticed that too. I mentioned that several times. They sure did. I noticed that you did too. <laughs> Players take issues with these characterizations and with defendant's assertion that these questions show bias. For example, defendant describes the question in 2E as showing juror number one question the defense witness in an adversarial manner by prefacing his question by asking if the witness could beyond doubt affirmed that, or was able to attest to something in the witness's testimony. Far from demonstrating juror number one was being adversarial towards the witness, it was more likely that it shows he was only mimicking the lawyers for both parties that he'd been listening to for so many weeks. That too. Or whatever. I don't care. But sure, mimicking the lawyers, that works for me too. I, I don't care, but that works for me. I'm beyond caring. Also, notable example is, see, I've, I have not prejudged the defendant's mo plaintiff's motion. I judged it. I judged it, and I found it wanting. Now I'm reading the response, but I've already decided it's full of shit because I didn't need your response, but I'll read it anyway. Another notable example is 2i, in which defendant complains about juror number one Prefacing question by saying Maya was more mature than a usual 10-year-old and handled her pain differently. 
Dr. James Lewis, who conducted Maya's psychological examination when she was at the hospital and being investigated by the team, described Maya in these terms. Juror number one, using the same description of Maya, shows no bias for or either party. Apparently, she the, the juror just agreed with Dr. James Lewis's characterization. They like Dr. James Lewis. They find Dr. James Lewis credible. Eat me. The parties do not have the exact words of juror number one's comments in question to nurse Sylvia Balwig, in which she stated that she was a breath of fresh air. Defendant's first example. While the plaintiffs agreed juror number one described the witness as a breath of fresh air, they disagree with the characterization of what juror number one meant by this. To the best of plaintiff's recollection, juror number one did not explain his comment, and he certainly did not say he thought the witness was the first person from defendant who appeared to have cared about Maya Kowalski. And even if they did say that, I still wouldn't care. Because if that's the juror's opinion, that's their opinion. So I still wouldn't care. One, one possible interpretation is juror number one thought plaintiff's counsel had questioned her too aggressively, and he was simply being encouraging to her. That reasonable people could interpret the statement differently, however, demonstrates the question the comment does not show bias. Yeah, I don't care because this is all within the province of the jury. If this was literally the first witness, the entire trial that they believed or found credible, I still wouldn't care. Because that's what the juror does. That's what the jury does, right? If they did, if they thought this was the only witness that told the truth the whole time, I still wouldn't care. Because that's what juries do, right? They listen, then they choose what witnesses they. I'll give you the paraphrase of the standard instruction, right? You, the juror, as juries, are the finders of fact. You may believe any witness in whole or part, in fraction, or any combination thereof. If you believe a witness in part, you may choose to believe them in other parts. If you disbelieve a witness in part, you may choose to believe them in parts, or you may choose to disbelieve them in other parts. It's up to you. Wow. Amazing. Deep. Wow. <laughs> Defendant's motion also admits other questions asked by juror number one that were either completely neutral or could be revealed, reviewed as revealing bias in favor of the defense and against plaintiff. What do you mean they didn't present the entire picture? Oh, no. What are the odds? Juror number one asked defendant's witness, Jennifer McCann, McCain, MD, regarding the complexity of metal issues without any indicia of bias. Dr. McCain, in your testimony, you used the phrase similar to psychological component. Should I interpret that to mean there is a metal component, but there's also a physical component? Or does your phrase psychological component mean there's no physical component? Juror number one asked the defendant witness, nurse outside, regarding issues of fact for her first determination. Nurse, what color was Maya's court attire that you helped her change into? I'm, I don't care. <laughs> I, don't, I don't care. Nur, juror number one asked defendant's witness, nurse Alcide, about the timeline of events. Nurse, is this timeline clothing correct? Helped Maya get down to shorts and a white bra, yes? Photos been taken. You helped Maya into dress with the same white bra or changed her bra. Juror number one point to Nurse Rex Kindness. Nurse Miss Rex, it was very kind of you to tend to Maya's laundry. My question would be, why didn't the parents of Maya tend to their daughter's laundry? Was the need for you to tend to Maya's laundry because Maya's parents were negligent to their doctor cleanliness or needs, or was this something restricting their visitation? That sounds like a perfectly prudent question. Why did you have to do this? Why didn't the parents do this? What was going on? Juror number one asked an unbiased question to the defendant's witness. Doctor, if during this time, Dr. Smith, per Mr. Shapiro, was acting as the DCF employee, then is it proper for Dr. Smith to act as contributing staff member? Okay. Juror number one then continued to ask unbiased questions to defendant's witness regarding the timeline events. Dr. Tepa, how long did Maya spend in the ER before being transferred to the PICU? When Maya was transferred to the PICU, was the mood of Maya and parents on a more even slash calmer level, or was there still a flurry of confusion? Juror number one tried to limit the plaintiff expert witness, Dr. Kilpatrick, to a simple answer by acting, 
asking Dr. K in the simplest terms is safe to say, and a simple yes or no will do. Juror number one has thoughts. Juror number one has questions. They're an active juror. Wow. Some jurors are more active. Some jurors are more passive. Are you sad that you didn't get the jury that you want? Are you sad that the jury that is, is not deciding in your favor? I am so sorry for your sadness. I can't be bothered to care. I can't be bothered to care. Uh, jury number one sought information related to Maya's alleged CRPS diagnosis, indicating that he had not determined whether he, whether he, whether she had or has CRPS or not. Apparently asking all, oh, Maya was discharged with three or four diagnoses and none were CRPS, correct? When, if at all, was Maya ever examined and given a diagnosis of CRPS? Okay, I mean, you know, fair enough. Right? Does Maya have, does Maya have CRPS? Is it Munchausen by proxy? Is it something else? Sounds like questions of fact to me. <laughs> Sounds like questions of fact to me. You know? <laughs> Jury number one sought guidance on the issues relating to Detective Graham's interview of Jay Jack Kowalski. His questions indicated he wanted to know the law behind Dr. Graham's intentions in her interview and maintained an open mind. Dear Judge, clarification please. Cameras and reasonable expectation of privacy. What is the law? And in a hospital setting, in a private single occupancy room, is there an ex expectation of privacy? I think yes, but please educate me. Juror number one continuously questioned Maya's CRPS diagnosis. After being released from the hospital in January 2016, has Maya ever been re-diagnosed with CRPS? Okay. Maybe... Maybe juror number one has questions as to what, whether Maya has CRPS. Who knows what juror number one is thinking? Ju juror number one has questions. You know, I, I don't know the degree to which these questions can necessarily be indicative of the of the the jurors thinking. Incidentally, I don't know how jurors' questions compare to judges' questions, but for whatever value it has, I'll, I'll just point out, you know, that that a judge's questions may or may not reflect their own thinking. Sometimes, and this is obviously more true, uh, sometimes it's, this is obviously more true on a, on a multi-judge panel, like an appellate panel, but sometimes judges ask questions to basically poke at another judge, right? They're not really asking you a question. They're really poking at another judge. You just simply are a convenient vehicle for them to do that. And that is your that is your role in this opera, right? You are not the star. You are merely a vehicle by which I can harangue one of my other fellow judges. So yeah. Wednesday, if 88 says, quoting from Law and Lumber, sir, are you asking this jury to disregard the truth in favor of your lies? Yeah. So, and I, I would imagine it's true for even a trial judge. And sometimes the trial judge is asking questions to the degree they do for for clarification, not necessarily indicative of their thinking. You know, sometimes they're asking for reasons beyond the obvious. And so, yeah. So maybe this juror is questioning whether Maya has CRPS. I don't know. Maybe they are. Maybe this jury will surprise us all and rule in favor of John Hopkins. I don't know. You know, probably not, but you know, hey, jurors are weird. Jurors, jur jurors can do things. They're the finders of fact. They are your God now. <laughs> Defendants correctly state that a party seeking to remove a juror from improper conduct during a trial must show the juror's actions amount to misconduct. Yeah. Uh, no, I don't believe it's unanimity. I believe it's only a majority. 
for the civil thing. So I think they need, I think they need four out of six. Um, but I could be wrong on that number. Uh, defendants cite three cases for this proposition, which without providing any factual descri description of the cases of their holdings. The first two cases are very factually different. Oh, you don't say. There's differences in the facts, you don't say. The third case, however, Washington v. State is remarkably similar. Washington held that a trial court abused its discretion. Unanimity in Florida? Okay, fair enough. I stand corrected. Peter would know. He's an attorney in Florida. I'm happy to be corrected if I make a mistake. So unanimity. I stand corrected. Fair enough. Uncivil law makes mistakes sometimes. It's okay. We move on. Yeah. Okay. Washington held the trial court abuse of discretion by removing a juror based on purportedly biased questions a juror asked during trial. And although defendant cannot be criticized for failing to cite the case, it did so only by burying it in a string site. That's a nice little legal burn. That's a nice little legal burn. It's like, yeah, they disclosed the authority. They just didn't make it particularly apparent. That's a nice burn to the other side. I, I appreciate that. In Washington, the trial court instructed jurors at the beginning of the trial that they could submit written trials aimed at clarifying the evidence and encouraged them not to ask a large number of questions. During the trial, juror McCoy asked a great many questions. After all the testimony was presented, the trial court announced it was replacing juror McCoy with an honor because Miss McCoy was the only juror that asked any questions. A large majority of the questions asked to her by her were contrary to instructions, showed a lack of understanding the testimony that had been presented, were generally argumentative and hostile. The reconstituted jury ultimately returned a jury verdict and the defendant appealed. The first district reversed based on the fact that trial court's removal of jury McCoy. In an opinion from the appellate court, the court rejected the state's argument that jury McCoy's questions demonstrate misconduct by revealing bias. The court of appeals stating, Jury McCoy appears to have been skeptical of the state's witnesses, but that does not mean she could not be fair. Jurors are told the defendant is presumed to be innocent, and the state has the burden of showing guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. It should come as no surprise that some of them will have critical questions about the state's evidence. I mean, that's a pretty good point, right? They are literally told, hey, you know, the defendant's proved innocent. Hey, proof beyond a reasonable doubt. And then the prosecution gets all salty because the juror is actually asking probing questions of the prosecution's witnesses. They're like really putting them to the test. Like, you know, they actually took our instructions seriously and gave a presumption towards the defendant. Whoa, deep. Wow. Don't know where they got that idea from. <laughs> the court went on to observe, jurors are told they must not form any definitive or fixed opinion about the merits of the case until they've heard all the evidence. The arguments of the attorneys in the instruction law there is nothing in the record to suggest Jory McCoy violated this instruction. She may have been forming impressions as she was hearing the evidence, but we do not know what she may have thought after hearing the entire case. Right? She has opinions of the stuff she's heard so far. She's started to form conclusions about what witnesses she thinks are credible or not. But, you know, she hasn't heard things, so we don't know about what she will think about other things. It would be unrealistic to assume that jurors do not form impressions as they're hearing evidence. That is not proper, so long as the juror does not decide the case, the case, before it's concluded. So the jurors can form opinions about evidence. They can form opinions about witnesses. They can form opinions about the attorneys. And, you know, if they actually give the defendant the presumption of innocence of the criminal case, that's okay, too. Oli Murr says, but judge uncivil, this juror looks like they're trying to find out how many zeros gone on the check. And my side isn't asking for a check. Please kick this juror judge. No. <laughs> no. No. Sorry. No. Sounds like things are not going your way. 
Sounds like the sounds like the juror is not about to rule in your favor, ma'am. This is sad. I, you know, it, the thing that makes it so sad, the things that makes it so sad, is John Hopkins must really. What I'm reading into this is John Hopkins must really think they're screwed. Because to my ear, to my mind. And it could be due to any number of things. It could be due to, you know, just my knowledge of courts. But this just strikes me as such a desperation move. It strikes me as such a, you know, we are desperately clinging at, at the last straw and the last blade of grass. We are so, so incredibly desperate. Please save us. We're drowning. <laughs> it's not going well. It's such a desperate, it's so, it just reeks of weakness. It reeks of weakness. John Hopkins knows they have problems. Get a stiff drink, my friend. It's going to be a rough verdict. It's going to be a rough verdict, my friends. Maybe you'll get lucky. Maybe it won't be as bad as you think. Here, even if juror number one may have been forming impressions as hearing evidence, that's not improper. Duh. And certainly does not mean those impressions have not and will not change after hearing all the evidence and argument and after discussing the case with other jurors. Also, duh. Right? Jurors go into the jury deliberation room, and sometimes they ask for a vote right off the top, and sometimes they're not unanimous. And then sometimes they become unanimous because the jurors have discussions and deliberations. So even where a juror goes into a jury room with an idea of which side they're going to vote for, they may vote for a different side by the end. <sighs> Who knows what the other jurors think? Maybe they won't agree with juror number one, and maybe juror number one won't win the vote, and maybe juror number one will be convinced of some other proposition. Who can say? as they are listening to other people's arguments and perspectives. And that's interesting. I didn't consider that way. You know, that's an interesting point. You know, now that you now that you mention it, John Hopkins did nothing wrong, and they're fantastic. They're a great children's hospital. I'd be lucky to have my children sent there. Who knows what the juror will do, right? But, you know, that's just the way it... it or maybe not that. May, maybe not that, but either way. The court recognized a juror may be removed only for misconduct if there's evidence the juror violated an order or instruction. It concluded that unlike a juror who visits a crime scene, reads news accounts of the crime, or speaks to witnesses, juror McCoy's conduct was not clearly shown to be a violation of any order or instruction. Whether her questions were too numerous or too suggest suggestive are very subjective issues. To say that she was guilty of misconduct would require characterization that's a matter of an opinion as opposed to like fact. The same is true of juror number one's questions here, particularly when viewed in the entirety. And also, even if not viewed in the entirety, I don't care. You know, show me they did something improper. Show me they violated their voir dire. Show me they're not a statutory juror. You know, show me they're not legally allowed to be on this case. Show me they lied in their questionnaire or in their voir dire. Show me they've been doing improper investigation on their own. Show me misconduct or get wrecked. Get wrecked. The court also criticized the trial court for failing to question the juror, determine whether she thought the questions violated the questioning procedure, saying many potential juror misconduct issues can be diffused that way. Because the trial court simply assumed that she prejudged the case who could no longer be fair based solely on her questions, the trial court lacks support. Here, defendant has requested not to interview the juror, and there's no reason for one on this vacuous charge. I think, at least in principle, again, I'd have to read the decision for sure. I'm not sure whether the Court of Appeals is setting out a per se rule, but if you have enough information, you have enough information. I'm not sure asking a juror is required, but it was in that particular case. 
right? There's not a per se rule. The court expressed concern about how precedent would be set if we were to approve the lower court's decision to remove Dora McCoy. The credibility of the process would be undermined if it appeared. A judge was deciding which jurors could serve based on the inclinations they may have shown by their question. You think? Maybe they would pick the jurors that agree with the judge's thinking as opposed to their own? That's not a risk worth taking. Yeah, and then you've just transformed the right to a jury trial into a into a into a into a meaningless thing because the judge will strike any juror that they don't that doesn't rule their way. They must be biased. They don't think like I do. <sighs> Rather than discuss that case, defendant relies heavily on Alberger, which we discussed a little bit. In Alberger, the trial court determined a juror's questions and comments were not objective and unbiased. I removed the jury without questioning. The appellate court affirmed because the trial court held a superior advantage over this court in determining the full force and effect of the jurors' questions and comments. Because the opinion does not recite what those questions and comments were, well, that's super helpful. The Court of Appeals didn't even tell us the facts. That's just great, Court of Appeals. Thanks a lot for that. That's just super duper helpful. The Court of Appeals don't even bother to tell us what the facts are. So I can't even blame counsel now because the Court of Appeals didn't mention it. That's just great. Because the Court of Appeals does not recite what, you know, the appeal was about, because why would you do that, silly appellate court? We cannot know if it was so flagrantly biased that no other interpretation is possible. So the, the issue on appeal is whether the questions were so biased and flagrant, and the Court of Appeals doesn't bother to tell us what the questions are. That's just great work from the Court of Appeals, guys. That's super-duper work from the Court of Appeals. Why be, bo why be bothered with the factual basis which undergirds your decision? So that, you know, other courts, for example, could figure out what the hell... What am I supposed to do as a court with this precedent? What the hell am I supposed to do with this precedent as a court? What am I supposed to do with this? If I'm a trial court, what the hell am I supposed to do? I've got a court of appeals decision that says, oh yeah, the judge wasn't wrong to remove this juror because the questions were like, whatever, and they don't tell me what the questions are. How am I supposed to apply this as precedent? It'll be okay, Kurt. It'll be okay. It'll be okay. It'll be okay. Defendant claims that Alberger supports the proposition that questioning a juror under these circumstances could reinforce prejudice or bias without cause. Alberger says nothing of the sort. It's in fact utterly silent on the point, except to say the trial court was in the best possible position to make the determination. This precedent is useless to me. I, I can't do anything with this. I've got useless precedent. That's just great. That's what I need in my life. Finally, plaintiffs note that the cases cited in paragraph four of the motion all involve jury selection, not the disqualification of an impaneled juror, which I would think is, you know, a different posture, right? Striking a potential juror versus striking a juror who's already sitting raises somewhat different issues, I would imagine. A potential juror may be excused if there's reasonable doubt as to impartiality, but in panel juror may only be removed for misconduct. Yeah. So like all those cases we're dealing with whether or not to seat a juror. So you decided not to seat the juror because you had some doubts. But once the juror is seated, you can't just remove them for the hell of it. So the power to remove a potential juror is wider than the power to remove a juror who's already sitting. Wow. Tell me something I already didn't know. That's great. The decision's observations that a judge removing a juror for perceived harsh questions could undermine the judicial system applies with more force when a party litigant tries such a strategy. If litigants are empowered to remove jurors they do not like based on harsh questions, this will become a prevalent new tactic. If there's ever a situation in which a juror's questions might deem to be misconduct, this is not it, not even close. I concur. I concur. 
Because they failed to show any misconduct, this should be denied. Also, you suck as a person, and I don't like you personally, and I laugh in your general direction. But those are words I added. Those are words, those are words I added. So they're gonna lose. They're gonna lose. I'll be inter- I'll be amazed at the juror if the judge even entertains it. <laughs> that's what I'll be amazed at if they even if they even entertain it, to be honest. Because of how incredibly, incredibly dumb it is. So I plaintiffs are plaintiffs are right. And you know, the juror just doesn't believe you. It sounds, which, you know, may or may not actually be reflective of the juror's thinking, to be honest. Again, as we noted, you know, I, I would be cautious. You know, I would be very cautious as a lawyer because I don't know, well, there's not enough experience with jurors asking questions, you know, from the witness, from the juror's box. But lawyers are well advised to not read too much into jurors' questions from the juror deliberation room. Right, those 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 tea leaves are best read on 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 red, not for least reasons. There's nothing you can do about it now, <laughs> right? So the temptation is to try to read jurors' questions from the from the from the deliberation room, like it's giving you insight as to what the juror's thinking. But uh, I think the consensus wisdom is, you know, not really. Uh, it doesn't really give you insight, and mostly is just uh, frustrating. So yeah. So that's what's going on with all that. Pretty entertaining. Thank you for the thousand of you who are jo- joining me, by the way. I'm really appreciating that you're here. But yeah, this this case is incredibly complicated on the on the case and on the law. Um, I think for me, uh, I, to make it simpler, like for me, the easier things, the easier stuff to do is before the the the, uh, the uh, hospital had permission from the court or from court order where they were treating Maya initially and refused to discharge her and like did oper- did medication stuff with her and against her parents' permission and photographed her without her parents' permission at a time when they didn't have a court order. So for me, that's like the easiest stuff, right? Because it's like, look, you can't do that, right? It's like, and they're like, oh, you know, the, the consent to treatment is the consent to any of these things. Like, n- no, it's not. You know, like the patient can the patient can decline individual things like that. And if they want to be discharged, you, if, as long as they're in a medical condition to be discharged, which is to say, you know, they're not in critical condition, as long as they're stable, discharge them. So um, that's the easiest thing. And then once the court orders get involved, it gets harder legally. But um, yeah. So things are things are always complicated. Hey, Recovery Addict is here. I'm glad. I like Recovery Addict. You should definitely check out his channel as well. That's a he said, she said, where's the proof? Well, the photographs for starters, which are in the risk assessment file. So the fact the photographs were taken, and as to and and, and as to what that's also a very strange question. Where's the proof that there was no consent? We've heard testimony from Maya and other people that there was no consent. The pr- testimony is proof, or testimony is evidence, right? There, there, there's like no such thing really as proof. There's evidence, right? And so testimony is evidence. We've heard testimony that there was no consent. We've heard testimony, and uh, like John Hopkins doesn't even really deny it, incidentally, that there was no consent. They, they're they all about like, you know, well, the, the consent was in the consent to treat. That's where the consent comes from. So John Hopkins doesn't even really deny that there was no consent for the stuff that they did. Her parents had the ability to consent, at least in the first instance, you know, because her parents are her guardian. Um, but until the court got involved. So for those first couple of days, you know, I don't think there's any dispute as to who her, who had the ability to consent. Her parents had the ability to consent. Um, Duncan Idaho said, uh, for $20 said, glad you're following this, Kurt. How likely do you think the judge will deny the motion? Very likely. And say, you agree to the jury and you agree to the questions denied. Or he might excuse a juror for appeal reasons. Nah, 
I don't. I doubt it. This judge knows he's getting appealed. This judge knows for an absolute certainty he's flying on the edge of the law. He's trying to do something unknown to law. He's trying to do something novel in law. As Rob has pointed out, there has never been a case that's gone to juror ever with with suicide as a cause of action for an IIED, because it's legally been viewed as an intervening cause, because the person made the choice. And it breaks the chain of causation. So there's never been a case before with so and all and also it's even arguably worse than that because the IID, such as it is, was more directed at Maya than Maya's mother. So the the harm is divorced from the um actions, right? It the harm, the harm wasn't targeted at Maya's mom. You know, it was tangential. So it's there's so there's a double causality problem. There's a causation in fact art problem, and there's a causation proximity causation problem. So it, it it will absolutely be appealed. And assuming the jury finds for the IID, I think it will be reversed on appeal. Because I don't think the law is prepared to go there. Um so the judge knows they're flying in the face of this. And uh so I don't think the judge is going to throw off a juror for this reason, because the judge, I think, has every expectation they're going to be reversed on appeal. Because they're trying something new. And uh, I don't know. Yeah, Criminal law is already there. To some degree, that's true. But then again, that's by statute. Right? So if the legislature had done this by a legislative act, as they have in the case of criminal law, then that would be one thing. But this isn't, being, this isn't being done by legislative act. There's no legislative act by the Florida legislature that's making this possible. The court is trying to do this by pure common law. He's trying. The court is trying to invent a new cause of action before our eyes. And uh, yeah, that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to invent a new cause of action right before our eyes. Which, you know, that's... A lot of the history of common law, so it's not like it's something completely foreign to the concept of foreign law. It's just, common law, it's just not something you see every day. It's like the judge is literally trying to invent brand new law before our eyes. And I'm like, okay, it's, it's yeah, it's a lot. Tony P gifted ten gift memberships. Robert Price has been a member for 19 months. Thank you for hitting that beautiful, beautiful join button, Robert. It's always appreciated. Alan Parker gifted 20 gift memberships. Alan Parker, as always, has been a constant contributor to this channel, and his continuing support is deeply appreciated. Automayo said $5. One Number one was the one who said newbie. He was confirmed to be a gamer via his question notes. Truly a member of the most depressed class. FOP444 for $5. Said, will the other jurors know about this? No, they won't. It's not even likely juror number one will ever know about this, to be honest, no matter which way it goes. Duncan Idaho for $10 says, I was just wondering what you think of the likelihood as the elements of the motion reading the threshold of the judge's desire to lock it up against appeals. That's that's impossible. This is set for appeal. This is set for appeal. This is set for a decision by the Florida Supreme Court someday. There is no avoiding this. And, yeah. So if, if, the, if the judge is trying to avoid appeals, he's doing a really bad job at it. <laughs> Guy Seppi gifted one gift memberships. Wednesday 88 said, quoting Long Lumber, sorry, asking this jury to describe the truth in favor of your lies. Retired Nana has been a member for 14 months. Thank you for hitting that beautiful, beautiful join button. Retired Nana says, Judge Carroll isn't very happy with the hospital right now. I know, because one of their hospitals, let's say, somewhat misstated something before the judge and you know judges don't really like it when you don't are not fully honest to the tribunal and they catch you in a let's say contradiction that that tends to make them unhappy and again that's not prejudice because they're basing it off of what you did in the courtroom just now and if they decide to hate you because they don't like you because they find you to be not credible that is a you problem Oh, I Murr gifted ten dollars to say, but judge on civil. This juror looks like they're trying to find out how many zeros goes on a check, and my side isn't asking for a check. Please kick the juror. Cynthia McKenzie became an uncivilian. Thank you for hitting the join button. It is appreciated. Retired Nana for five dollars says the whole juror has been asking very good questions. Not only number one, but number one's questions are bad. Retired Nana, so that's the problem. 
Rex Fire gifted five dollars to say love your commentary. Thank you. Cast the Sass gifted ten gift memberships. Tony P gifted twenty gift memberships. Cast the Sass then gifted an additional ten gift memberships, and that is all extensively appreciated. Yeah. Tony P gives an additional 10 gift memberships. Thank you very much. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah, intentional infliction of emotional distress is IIED. Yeah. Words are conduct that is so far beyond the pale that no reasonable person should be forced to bear it. But there is a problem because, like, what did the hospital do or say to Maya's mother? You know? As separated from Maya. So that's sort of the challenge, you know? You have to look for things that are directed to the mother, and those are harder to find. And then you've got the causation problem, both proximate and actual causation. So, yeah. Do you think the hospital will be paying for their system-wide and egregious mistakes? If the, if, they, if the judge lets it in, which my expectation is the judge will, because it's valid as rebuttal testimony, right? And so the best you can hope for at this point is like the judge issues a cautionary instruction that's only offered for credibility and not liability, which no juror will understand the difference and it won't matter. Because when you lie on the stand, like evidence that otherwise would not be admissible becomes very admissible. You're not allowed to lie. So if things are excluded, you know, if things are excluded, and you get on the stand and you start telling lies, that excluded evidence becomes admissible real fast for credibility reasons. And like you can get the instruction that says, okay, this is only offered for credibility and shouldn't be used in your decision to decide like the underlying merits. But lawyers have a hard time keeping that straight. Do you think the jury understands the difference? Not a chance, man. So like, yeah, I'm, ad I'm admitting this only for credibility, not liability. You totally understand the difference, right? Yeah. So I think the judge is going to admit it. $5 from Duncan, Idaho. So I guess I don't understand, but my thought is, was the judge would not want a verdict overturn on appeal, not that he wants to prevent appeal. Yeah. The judge can't avoid the verdict being overturned on appeal, though the judge is trying something truly novel. There's never been a cause of action like this before anywhere, ever, that's made it to a juror. This is a brand new cause of action. It's a mod Technically, it's a modification of an existing cause of action, but what's the difference, really? Right? Because it could wind up with a different name someday, right? Because that's how things start, right? The first assault case ever was just a modification of battery law. And then we gave it a new name and we called it assault instead of battery. Right? So this is a modification of intentional infliction of emotional distress. So let's call it a modification, but maybe we give it a new name sometime. You know, this is how law gets created, man. Right? So appeal is, un appeal is unavoidable. The verdict being overturned on appeal, I think, is unavoidable. A... a, a, a a verdict in Maya's favor that fought, that rules for intentional infliction of emotional distress. Yeah. Magical Mary says, if plaintiff wins on appeal, do you think the defense may win on appeal for IIED only or at all? Well, a lot's going to depend on the juror's instructions and how the jury's instructed and also their verdict form. It depends the degree to which they are going to be severable by the judge. So if the judge is particularly smart and thinking ahead and God hopes, he will separate out the jury forms so that the jury gives a value for each cause of action separately. So if the court of appeals reverses, they can see exactly what needs to be done as opposed to not being, not knowing. So I think it is, it is, 
the uh, the juror instructions and the juror verdict forms are going to be very critical to that question. So as long as they're able to be severed by the court of appeals, then they may not they not, they may not reverse it all. If this judge, for whatever reason, decides to lump it all together, and the court of appeals is like, well, we don't know what to do, then they'll strike it all. So it depends a lot on what the judge does in the juror questionnaire in the in the verdict questionnaire, to be quite honest. What's my take on the judge directing the hospital give all the documents related to their surveys? I don't blame the judge because he found a contradiction in the witness testimony and he wants discovery and he wants it because he's like, there's a real problem. Like you don't get on the stand and then say something completely false and be like, that's not true. You know, we have evidence exactly to the contrary of that. And it's like, okay, well now it's all fair game where it wasn't before. You're the ones who opened the door, jackasses. This is what happens when you open the door, you know? Yeah. On intentional infliction of emotional distress, this is where Emily D. Baker said morality and legality verge. Depending on your view of morality, quite possibly. Uh, yeah, possibly. Cast the sass, gift to 10 gift, gift dollars. Although I think the moral questions are also, as I've expressed, I think the moral questions are not even as clear for me. Um, I've had a tough time with this case on a moral level because I can kind of see myself in all these roles. I can kind of I can kind of understand it from every point of, or, or from all the points of view. So it's not it's not abundantly clear to me that there is a villain in the first instance. Um, that may as it relates to some of this stuff now some of it may be be beyond the standard of care and some of it may be a medical malpractice in that sense which is which is fine but i'm not i'm not really personally sure there was a villain there is a villain in the first instance because i can i can see the pro the problem is i'm trying to go back in in my mind like i'm trying to put myself in the position like John Hopkins and, and Dr. Smith were when Maya came to the hospital. Like, what is their position, right? Because you can only judge people based on what they know at the time, right? Anything else is unfair, right? People make decisions all the time in incomplete information. People have to make decisions all the time in incomplete information, particularly as it relates to medicine. Doctors have to make decisions. Sometimes they have to make very snap decisions because the person's about to bleed out in the next five seconds, right? So sometimes, uh, sometimes you have to make decisions and sometimes you have to make decisions in a position of potential ignorance. And you just have to make a decision based on your best assessment of the situation based, and also probabilities, like, you know, based on your experience and training and your information and trying to form the best overall opinion that you, that you uh, can. Um, so I'm trying to put myself in the position a little bit of John Hopkins and Dr. Smith when Maya first came into the hospital and I, I could very easily understand how John Hopkins and or Dr. Smith and or anyone else, um, could view this situation the way they did like CRPS is a diagnosis by exclusion. It's not a dot. There's no test for CRPS, so it's a diagnosis by exclusion. You know, it's it's something that you do because you it's a, it's a giant I don't know button. Okay, CRPS is I don't know. CRPS is an I don't know. And it's a, it's a label for I don't know, and uh, that exactly doesn't endear yourself with a whole host of confidence, right? It's like I don't know what's wrong. Right? But we give a label for it. We'll call it CRPS. So it makes it feel it makes it feel like we know what the hell we're talking about when we clearly don't. Um, and I could totally see the doctor saying to themselves, look, this Munchausen by proxy is more likely. Which I think is probably correct. You know, and um, 
you know, other doctors have made incorrect calls. And, uh, you know, I'm the doctor now and I have to make a call. And I made the call this way because I believed it was correct on a, on a fundamental level. And professionals do that. Professionals do that. And I could see myself as a lawyer doing that in a, in a situation. I could see myself as a lawyer who, you know, other lawyers touched the case and I made a different decision and lawyers would disagree with me and maybe I'm right and maybe I'm wrong. And it's like, you're making a decision because you think it's right. So it's a little, it's a little bit hard for me to, it's a little bit hard for me to judge Dr. Smith in the first instance and Johns Hopkins in the first instance, you know, because, well, you know, also, uh, you know, generally speaking, people, at least in my view, are generally good. You know, e evil people are tend to be rarer. And, um, you know, so I, I, maybe I just want to see the good in them. But I'm I'm a little bit more hesitant to just to just condemn them completely. Um, the judge said the other day the juror instructions will not be lumped together and the verdict sheet will mirror that. I hope that's true. Um, KBF says I've dealt with CPS cases and child abuse specialists. They're the worst. Sally Smith made the MBP call without ever examining Beta, and based only on a short visit with Maya. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe that's true. A lot of you guys are probably more informed about the case, to be honest. I haven't been following it as closely as many of you have. So I have a pretty good understanding of the background of the case, but I haven't been following every moment like Rob has. So I would defer to Rob for an opinion about how he views the situation. Um, you know. Yeah. yeah, Dr. Smith disregarded other ju ju judges' doctor's diagnosis, and therefore she's not a good doctor. I don't know if that's true. Like, sometimes other doctors are wrong. You know, sometimes the, sometimes the consensus is wrong. And, you know, there's plenty of lazy doctors who will just go along with, you know, whatever the previous guy said. You know, but... You know, if, if, you know, if she had been right, I think we'd all be telling a different story. So I, you know, I just, I, I just am hesitant. I, I want to separate out, I want to separate the, out the outcome from the decision. That's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to separate out the outcome from the decision. And I'm trying to say, was the decision wrong? And without respect to the outcome. Because again, when you make the decision, you can't possibly know the outcome. You're, you're making a guess. That's true anytime you make a decision. You can't possibly know the outcome. You're making a guess. And sometimes you'll be right and sometimes you'll be wrong. So it, it, the, the answer to my mind can't be based on what happened. The answer has to be at the moment that decision was made. Was it right at the time? Or not? And so... I don't know. I just, I, I just have a more complicated view. And if you guys, you guys may have been listening to more of this. To be quite honest, again, my, I, you guys may have more fully informed view. Um, so I'm, I'm more than willing to defer on this one because I haven't watched every minute of testimony. Uh, this isn't, this isn't one of those situations where I have as exhaustive a knowledge. You know, there have been times where I've really put my foot down because, like, no, I know everything. We just disagree. This isn't one of those times. You know, I don't know everything. So I I do not have as full a factual picture as some of you guys do. I know I don't. And so I'm I'm willing to defer a little bit on this one because it, it could quite possibly be the case that if I had as much knowledge as some of you guys had, that I'd agree with you that's more slam dunk. And I'm just basing my opinion on a on a too abstracted view of the situation. But I'll share with you my perspective, whatever it is, as, and then just admit that it is not as well informed as some of them are. But, you know. Jay Hash has a long history of awful treatments, many settlements through lawsuits. Yeah, I mentioned that in my uh, Take Care of Maya video. I mentioned uh, their history 
as a hospital, which is uh, tainted at parts. Um, thank you, Jingleberry, for the uh, super chat. Yeah. So, yeah. it's kind of dark in here now. The sun went away. It's like I just got a floating head now with a back background. That's kind of cool. Ooh, score, scary story time. I could even do I could even do a flashlight under my chin. Ooh. Happy Halloween, everyone. Bwahahaha. Uh, the sun was doing a good job, but it's been a while. Yeah, the sun went. The sun. The sun went down. Hopefully, it will come back tomorrow. <laughs> Who knows, though, right? Who knows? <laughs> Have I seen Red Dwarf? I I think I've seen an episode or two, but not super familiar with it. More purple? Actually, it's more of a red, to be honest. Kind of a reddish, dark reddish, kind of like a wine color. Yeah. What else can we talk about? Uh, is there any other things we can talk about? Because you know, I've got this. I've got a thousand of you here, and I'm happy to talk about other things. Are there cases in the news you guys want to talk about, or other things we can talk about? What's on your thought thought process? What else you want to talk about today? As long as I got an audience, I'm happy to talk. What's my opinion on YouTube and ad blockers? Um. Well, I mean, YouTube has been a cost to Google and Alphabet. I, I don't believe they've ever made a profit. Um, so I certainly don't blame them for trying to find additional revenue. Um, the degree to which that will impact people, I don't know. Um, and be good for the environment as a whole. So I'm, I'm not sure. Australian later lady arrested for mushroom murders. Okay. How much is SBF going to enjoy prison? Probably not very much. He won't have as as good internet access as he's used to. Um, so things are not going to be going well for him for a while. Have I heard about the Australian woman charged with two counts of murder and three counts of attempted murder after serving, serving poisonous mushrooms in a meal? I have not. Maybe, you know, check your mushrooms. Check what mushrooms you're serving. Did I watch Charlie Adelson take the stand? No, I haven't heard about that. Alex Murdoch and Judge Newman, we covered that a little bit yesterday during the legal roundup with the motion to recuse. I think Judge Newman should be recused. He's just too close to the situation. It doesn't necessarily require him to have done anything wrong. I'm not, I'm not accusing Judge Newman of doing anything wrong. He's just simply too close to the situation. Um, so... Did I hear that a judge that searched a guy's house and divorce was denied immunity? Doesn't surprise me. He's acting well outside his judicial role. So it doesn't surprise me because that's a law enforcement role doing a search. If he actually went and did a search, no, that must surprise me.
I look very relaxed. I am very relaxed. I'm visiting my parents. I'm having a great time. Would a judge worry about how she'll look when an appeal court sees unethical actions? Well, I'll, I'll take the word unethical out of it because unethical is a bit of a different thing. Um, do a judges do judges worry about being overturned on appeal? Really depends on the judge, to be quite honest. Some judges don't care. It isn't to say that they won't follow instructions. They just don't worry about it. And I totally understand that. I, I kind of think it's admirable to some degree. It's like, you know, I'm just not going to worry about whether the Court of Appeals reverses me or not. I'm not going to, like, metagame myself. I'm just going to make a decision that the Court of Appeals reverses me, then fine. I'll do something different, but I'm not going to worry about it too much in the first instance. Some judges worry about it more. Some judges worry about it less. It's really kind of in the personality of the judge. As long as the judge is following the instructions from the court above, then I, I don't really think there's the right answer to that question. Five dollars from Twist, Twist I, D L O J K. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. Ju Judge Newman is simply too close to it. He had personal interactions in this case. He has, he knows the he knows the clerk of court on a personal level. He's probably at least partially a necessary witness. He's too close to the case. In all the cases I've ever covered on YouTube, what was my favorite judge and why? Um, although we didn't get to see him very much, I kind of liked the judge that we were seeing in the SBF case just because it was a judge who was willing to make decisions and keep keep people going and was a judge who was in control of their courtroom and kept things moving. I also like judge I also like chess clock. Chess clock is best clock. So since Judge A was the first judge I saw use the chess clock, Judge A gets a vote just because I'm like, the chess clock is the greatest invention ever for litigation. Here's how much time you get. Your time is running. When you get to zero, you can't talk anymore. I like this very much. More, more, more courts with chess clock, you know? Twisted logic like your mind, $2. Thank you very much. Twisted logic. I guess it does say that. Okay, fair enough. Am I going to cover the Petito laundry trial? No, probably not. Um, I, I, have, I, I, I don't really believe in the case. I thought it should have been dismissed long ago. I'm going to probably wind up covering the Crumbly trial. And in May... Uh, uh, isn't Donald Trump on trial about that point? So whenever Donald Trump's on trial, you know, that's obviously what I'm going to be covering. What's with the light situation? The sun set, and I couldn't be bothered to turn on the light behind me. So uh, the, 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 the light situation is I've got one light on in the room. I've got one light bulb on that's right in front of me to illuminate my face, and I don't have the lights on in the court in the room, and it got dark because the sun went away. So I'm blaming the sun. <sighs> Sarah Boone's letters have always been entertaining. She is crazy. <sighs> she is a treat, Sarah Boone's letters. On the plus side, we're saving the environment over here. We're 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 running this we're running this this home with one headlight. We can make it home with one headlight. Okay. Yeah. We try telling a scary ghost story. Okay, should, should we tell a scary ghost story? 
Beware lots you law tube. There are scary lawyers everywhere you go. Ooh. Beware, my friends, of, of police officers who say they just want to be your friend and only have a simple few questions. Ooh. Beware of the officers who say that they just want you to come by the office because they have a few clarifying questions. Very scary indeed. Don't do it. Don't do it. Woo! Beware. The cop is not your friend. When the cop asks, can I search your car? Yes is not the correct answer. Keep your mouth shut. <sighs> what if you're driving the booty patrol truck? I would not recommend speaking to that officer either, especially if you're a young woman. On the plus side, he is telling you exactly what he wants. So I, I guess there's that. Will I be crashing lawn lumber chat tonight? Yeah, I might join completely. He goes live in what, an hour hypothetically? I might have dinner and join him. I might sign off here and have dinner. Let's see. Yeah, he's scheduled to go eight o'clock. Okay. We can spend uh, 15 more minutes together. Then I'm going to have dinner. And then I might try to be on Rob's stream tonight. Layback news was fun today. I did enjoy it. Yeah. Thoughts on the house speaker situation? I'm glad it's over. All right. Can I can I talk more? Let's see if YouTube cuts me off again. This will be hilarious. All right. So I want to finish my thoughts that I was trying to do on the whole situation in Israel when apparently. My stream got shut down, so we're going to try this again. I I, I continue to be amazed by, I, and I don't know why I, I'm amazed, but I am. I continue to be amazed by the people who are openly supporting Hamas and openly calling for the elimination of Israel because, you know, from the river to the sea. This, I don't, I don't get it, especially by many of the people who are calling for it. Right. The thing the first of all, I think it's wrong in the first instance. So there's that. Second of all, some of the people who are saying these things, like if that ever came to pass, would literally be the first up against the wall. Right? The 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 Jews for Palestine and the gays for Palestine people have got to be the most confused people on the face of the earth. This but this this truly befuddles me from like just a self-preservation principle. So first of all, I don't agree with it in the first instance. But even if I did, how can you be a Jew for Palestine or a gay for Palestine? Do you not know that they would literally throw you off the roof the first chance they get? I love the people I love the people who were out there saying, "Okay, we want a Palestinian state from the river to the sea." So we want the elimination of Israel. And what? And they say, okay, and then you ask them, what would happen if you did that? Oh, you know, the Jews would continue to live there in a Palestinian-run state. Really? You, 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 you think that if somehow... You, you, so your theory is somehow if Israel falls, 
and is replaced by a Palestinian state. Your theory is the 7 million Jews who currently live there would be allowed to continue to live there in a secular Palestinian state. That's your working theory. Do you, do you know anything about the charter of Hamas? Do you know anything about what they've said about their thoughts about Jewish people? Um, so these, these people, so the, the Jews for Palestine, the Jews for Palestine and the, the, the queers and gays for Palestine, I don't understand on any level. I, I just, it just defies my understanding and imagination. It's absolutely insane. You know, what are the total number of Jews that live in like the entire Arab, Arabic world? The entire like Muslim controlled world. Like how many Jews are living in, you know, like Egypt and Jordan and, you know, all those countries? Not, not many, man. Um, you know, it's, it's a small list. So, you know, it's like the whole thing is weird. So I, I don't understand it. Yeah, you know, I don't. I understand. I don't understand it at all. Um, and I don't. I don't really understand much of the Western world. For example, the UK and France and Germany, for example, at best being squishy when it comes to Israel. Like we had, there was that whole vote, you know, in the UN and the United States is like something one of what eight countries that votes no on like you know the bringing the war to an end, which, like, no, that's way premature. You know, I don't. And then they're tearing down, the people who are tearing down the signs of the Israeli children, including, incidentally, the British police who are doing it because, I don't know, something, something temperature, which, okay. I don't know how it inflames the temperature. I really... I, I, I suppose I maybe I don't want to understand how it inflames the, the temperature merely to post missing posters of children and people who have gone missing. I don't know how that inflames the temperature, but okay. I, you know, it's like, you know, I, I don't think that Israel is committing horrific acts. I don't, I don't, I don't agree with that. Um, there is a, there is a very, there is a very strong difference in law and in international law and under any treaty of war that you'd like to point to between what Israel is doing and what Hamas did. Hamas went into civilian areas to kill civilians with no particular military objective, apparently. They went in just to kill civilians. Their goal was just the murder of civilians. They weren't attacking military assets. They were attacking purely civilian assets. Okay? You can't deliberately target civilians. Israel, for its part, is attacking military assets. Hamas has, in violation of the rules of war, incidentally, put military assets inside of civilian assets. So when Israel, which targets the military assets, which they absolutely have the right to do under the laws of war, right? And then they hit civilian assets because the military assets are stored in civilian places. That's a violation of the rules of war of Hamas, not Israel. Hamas is responsible for that under the international conventions because Hamas is the one who put the military assets inside of civilian centers. They are literally using their own civilian population as human shields for military assets. Okay, so there there is a distinct difference in the rules of war. So under the rules of war, amazingly enough, you can't you know put military assets inside civilian assets. That's a violation of the rules of war, and you can't purposely target civilians. And if you put military assets inside a civilian asset, it becomes a valid military target. And that's true for hospitals and schools and anything else. You can go look it up in the rules of war. You know, you can't target a hospital unless the hospital now becomes a 
command and control center for the military, in which case now it's a military asset and you can target the hospital. So there's a distinct difference under law. You know, there's a distinct difference under law between what Hamas did and what Israel is doing. Israel is targeting military assets. Civilians are dying not because Israel's targeting them, but because Hamas put the civilians there. And that's the difference. So Hamas, Israel is not violating the laws of war. Hamas is violating the laws, laws of war. They've put military assets inside civilian assets, and the moment you do that, you convert them into military assets. Because, you know, the rules of war are in that way. They're not in the hospital, they're under the hospital. Either way, right, if they bombed, if, if Israel bombed the hospital, if, from my view of military law, that would be legal. It's because if they, if to get to the under the hospital, if they have to go through the hospital to get to the hospital, to get to the assets, they could go through it. So, yeah, if you put, yeah, oh, we put the bunker under the hospital, so it's no longer a military asset, please. Yeah. Please. So that's my view of the situation. And as far as I'm concerned, Israel can and probably should continue to send ground forces into Gaza and probably has to go into the tunnels at what I would imagine is great operational expense. They're going to lose a lot of troops doing it. But I don't see there's any alternative, unfortunately. They're going to have to go into the troops and clean it out, go into the tunnels and clean it out the hard way in what will I imagine will be a massive, massive casualties for both sides. But there's there's no alternative. War sucks. Yeah. So, yeah, they, they need a ground... Yeah, so I think them tar I, I don't think Israel has violated any rules of war. I think Israel has filed the laws of war as best as I can determine. Which isn't to say that, you know, you couldn't possibly find an instance of them doing something wrong because war is ugly. So I'm sure you could find something that Israel has done that's wrong. But even if they did, like, it's just massively different in character. Right? Israel does not go out of their way to violate the law. Hamas does. There's there's a huge difference. So, yeah. Hamas is the one converting civilian assets into military assets. They're the ones that are taking out plumbing out of the ground to use as rockets to fire into Israel and sending their paragliders and their paratroopers and their drones into civilian assets and, and putting babies into ovens and sending the oven on to watch the baby baby bake inside the oven as the parents scream and the, ch the parents get assaulted and they kidnap women and then they slice their Achilles tendon so they can't run away and they burn babies and then they put parents and children together to burn them so, yeah, that is not that is not collateral damage from war. There is a huge there is a huge moral difference between civilians being killed because they're collateral damage and being purposefully targeted. Hamas purposefully targeted civilians and took civilians and kidnapped civilians. Israel doesn't do that. So. I think Israel has to go in there and kick ass. And I think all these people ch ch chanting from the river to the sea either don't know what they're talking about. Or perhaps more disturbingly, they do. I, I I I suppose there was a great Babylon B article today about this that I read, where it's like skinhead meets Palestinian protester for argument, but they just wind up agreeing. You know, that was pretty funny, right? 
Palestinian protester tries arguing with skinhead, but they just wind up agreeing. Well, you know, I thought I was going to punch a Nazi, but it seems like we get along pretty well. Yeah. I don't know what it is. I don't know what it is. And I don't, I, 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 I don't know why some people hate Jewish people so much. I don't get it. I don't understand it. What did the Jews ever do? Like in the grand scheme of things, like, you know, what what they do? What they do to deserve all this, you know? I don't understand sometimes some why they're so hated. Yeah, I don't get it. I like I like Jewish people and I like Israel. Which isn't to say that I think Israel is a perfect state. It's not. You know, I don't even think the United States is a perfect state for that matter. But Israel is our ally, and I like them as a country. And I like their citizens, and I like Jewish people just fine. Jewish people are great. Well, I hate Jewish people. I don't get it. What do they do? Yeah, they're going to have a million protesters in London. I heard that for the Palestinian state. I don't get it. I don't understand it. I don't get it. I don't know. It doesn't make sense to me. For the causally problem, isn't the same reasoning similar to intent following the bullet? <sighs> um, you have the right idea. Um, I'm not sure the analogy works in this situation, but you have the right idea with intent following the bullet. So you know, if you sh intend to shoot person A and you hit person B, then you intend to shoot person B. So if you unlawfully shoot person A and hit person B, that's murder. If you lawfully shoot at person A and hit person B, it's not. So self-defense also works because you intended to hit person A. And so in this scenario, you have lawful self-defense against person A. So your, your lawful self-defense transfers because the intent transfers. Um, so your idea is right. I'm not sure it applies in this situation with the hospital. Because, well, it's very hard to find the bullet in this scenario, for starters. Um, it's not even clear, and it's also, like, from legal principles, not there that there's no particular duty to maya's mother there's a duty to maya because maya's in their care because it's a hospital but there's no particular duty to maya's mother like in the first instance so right idea but i don't think it quite works um, but i appreciate the try yeah so, I mean, I think Israel needs to do whatever it needs to do to, to kick ass, and Hamas needs to be eliminated. And uh, if they want to occupy Gaza permanently, they, they have my blessing as far as I'm concerned. I don't know that Israel wants to do that, but they can by me, because I don't recognize Palestine, so I don't care if they want to go in and occupy Gaza Occupy it to your heart's content for all I care. What, Israel said they won't go into the tunnels? I don't believe that. I don't believe that. Even if they said that, I don't believe that. All right, I'm going to sign off for now so I can catch some dinner. And I'll probably be on in a half hour or so with Robin Lumber. And I'll go ahead and direct you that way so that you can uh, anticipate him. Because, you know, that'd be nice. So I'll set up a redirect. And then I'm going to go get dinner, dinner. And hopefully I'll be on in a little bit later. So add redirect. Let's see. Add redirect. 
Let's see. Search for other videos. Come on. YouTube is being challenging tonight. I will get this done if I have to if I have to beat it to death. There it is. Save. Great. All right. I will see you guys a little bit later. Hope you have a good one. Bye-bye.